Okay. Which one? This one. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the other things that I was interested in, this is partly a selfish interest of mine, my dissertation work that I'm doing right now is on um, uh, supporting the writing needs for multilingual and multidialectal students. So I have a course in the program called ECE 308, Writing for Early Childhood Professionals, that I did my first year program evaluation on. So I was a little bit interested in seeing if the course actually helps students with their kind of overall success in the other course. So um, section A, the one that met every other week face-to-face, -face, took ECE 308 at the same time as ECE 301, and session, section B did not have ECE 308. And so there's a little bit of data in there showing how um, ECE 308 might have affected the outcomes for ECE 301. So a little bit of context about each section. So course A was fully bilingual. Um, so all 12 of the students in that section were bilingual English and Spanish. Um, it was taken during the fall of 2016. Again, this is the blended section, 50-50, every other week, face-to-face. Um, -face. And this group took the Early Childhood Professional Writing course, ECE 308, simultaneously. And then course B was a mix of students, multi-dialectal and bilingual. So we had 12 in this group who um, spoke African-American vernacular English, and then two who were bilingual Spanish and English. They did not have the writing course this term. Um, and this group was taking the course face-to-face -face once a month. Oh, and both courses were taught by the same instructor. So the first research question that I looked at was how do the students achieve the course learning outcomes in each modality? And there were two measures that I looked at. One was the overall grade of the course, and the second one was the writing rubric scores for child study paper. Um, so course A, the, cor the section that was fully bilingual, 89% average was the overall average for the course, all students passed. For course B, which was the multidialectal bilingual, and also the, the section that only met once a month, once a month face to face, that group had a 67% average and two students failed and dropped out of the cohort. Um, and then the other indicator was looking at the child study paper. And so we looked at for course A, this is the every other week group, fully bilingual. Um, in the rubric, there was a 35 out of 50 free of grammar and spelling errors. 31 of 50 had three references. So this is just looking at like the overall point. Is there more underneath that, Diane? I can't see the whole slide at all. No, that was all there was. But I... That's it, okay, okay. And then the other one, the, the other um, section scored just a little bit lower in the writing. And so the, again, that was that selfish kind of, I wanted to see what the writing differences were. So I looked at um, the writing rubric as well. But this, this the interesting thing here, I think, to look at is that the overall scores were lower for the section that met face-to-face -face once a month. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the second research question was, how do students experience relationships? So looking at things like instructor to student, student to student, and the learning process of each course context. So the data we looked at was the idea survey questions. I didn't use the additional data um, questions for idea. I used the ones that were already in place. Um, I looked specifically at the questions that had to do with relationships. And so there were two sets of questions around relationships. Um, and the scoring, as usual with idea, is a scale of one to five. One is hardly ever, and five is always. So for the first set of questions um, in course A, which was the face-to-face -face every other week fully bilingual, there was an average of five in terms of relationships. In course B, there was an average of 4.9. And then the second set of questions, there was an average of five, and I can't see what the second 4.89. So again, here with the IDEA um, surveys, the, the average for both sets of question was a little bit lower, just a little bit, with the section um, that met face-to-face -face once a month. 
Uh, okay, the next question that we looked at was how do students participate in the learning routine in each course context? Um, so we looked at the D2L user progress tool and we kind of figured out what the content visited was. So course A, this was the um, every other week, they looked at the content in D2L, uh, they looked at 88% of the content. So out of 100%, they looked at 88% of it. And course B, which is the face-to-face -face only once a month, looked at it a little bit more, so they were up to 94%. And then we looked at face-to-face -face attendance. So the every other week group met five times, and you can see the attendance data here. And then um, the group that met every other week, or I'm sorry, once a month, um, they met three times, so once a month, and you can see the data here. And one thing that's interesting to note is in session two and three, the two students that failed and then later dropped out of the cohort, those were the two students that didn't attend. Um, this question has to do with participating in the learning routines in each course content. So this is interesting, I think, when we think about how engaged our students in our online content. So I looked specifically at the engagement in the discussion post, the threads and replies. So the group that met every other week, um, they read 1,774 posts for an average of 148 posts each. They created 117 threads and they created 10 average each. They replied 208 times with an average of 17. And then the course that met every uh, once a month, they had uh, slightly less actually in each of these categories, which was interesting because they visited the content more by, I guess it was about 6% more of the content was visited overall in the course, but in terms of their engagement, it was actually less than the engagement for the course that met every other week. Mm. And so these are the takeaways and implications for the ECP portion of the research. Um, ECP students seem to engage more with the online material to a greater degree when there was increased face-to-face -face time. So when we looked at overall engagement, um, which we just saw, they were much more engaged when they met every other week. Um, the grades were higher, the rubric scores were higher um, in general, but also in terms of academic writing when there was increased face-to-face -face time. And then again, just because I was interested in the effectiveness of ECE 308, the grades in terms of writing were a little bit higher with that course paired. Um, there was higher attendance rate for the face-to-face -face sessions when there was increased face-to-face -face time. So the fact that they're seeing each other more meant that they came more. And then uh, in terms of the idea data, they experienced slightly more satisfying relationships within the context of the course uh, when there was increased face-to-face -face time. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. My turn, Diane. Yeah. All right, so here we go. This is MBA 503 my personal joy love. This is a six week course that is an introductory course in the MBA program. And it is a course that introduces the authentic leadership theme in the MBA program. We took a look at an online version of this course. It is associated with the Quality Matters certified template that's about 70 to 80 pages long. Students are performing a variety of activities. We're very heavy up on Harvard Business Review case studies in this course. Students also uh, engage in a, a systematic journaling process. They're blogging and they give a narrated presentation. The blended template for the course is a modification of the existing online template. We've taken some uh, discussions, for example, and other kinds of activities and put them into the into the face-to-face -face sessions on the blended side. This particular blended version meets every other week. So students were online for three weeks and they were face-to-face -face for three weeks. So I'm essentially incapable of brevity. So Diane, you'll just have to move those slides. There we go, all right. So, you know, I wanted to take a look at engagement in the course, student performance in the course, student perceptions in the course. So here you're taking a look at 
what, what I would call an engaged class experience across both modalities. Instructor engagement in the class discussions was about the same with uh, instructors posting 23 and 29% of posts on the board. The students were posting well above the requirements in both modalities. I would like to report to you that students in both modalities were reading 100% of the posts. We see this isn't exactly the case, but for purposes of comparison between the two course sections, they're rather similar in percentage. Students view all of the pages in the course with a little bit of you know, surfing fatigue in both modalities at the end of the course. And just as a sidebar, though it doesn't speak directly to engagement, I took a look at a discussion board that we have in this course. At the very end, we asked students what their, what their real takeaways are. So, you know, they're all professionals and then they're working and we're asking what, what really spoke to you in this course. And for both, uh, both modalities, emotional intelligence emerged as a high impact course theme, which I've seen before. But again, interesting to note, even that was the same in both modalities. Hmm. All right, so segueing here into performance, we've taken a look at engagement. Uh, so this is really a simple exploration of student performance on the major class assignments. I went into the rubrics. I actually looked at the subscales on the rubrics, nothing all that interesting to report there. And here, where you really, it, it looks like there's a small performance advantage in the online section. This is very small N uh, between the two course sections, so nothing reaches statistical significance. And going back in and looking student by student, anything you see here is, is particular to something going on with a student at, at a point in time. No performance differences to speak of between the two modalities. Staying on the theme of performance for just another moment, because the students particularly pointed to emotional intelligence as a theme that spoke to them, I went into an online case study discussion for both class groups and wondering what, you know, wondering what I would find. I do this from time to time because I think it's important, I know it's important, that in a discussion of this nature, we have to see emerging on the board a certain constellation of constructs if we're really really want to effectively inform a key learning outcome in, in the course. So you could have knocked me over with a feather here. You're looking at uh, my coding of keywords and key themes in the discussion board case study there between the two modalities. It's kind of astounding. They were right on top of each other in, in terms of their treatment of the subject matter. So performance just looking very similar between the, between the two modalities here. And keep in mind, what you're seeing here is what I can touch, what I can count. So that's what I'm reporting. Mm -hmm. Next slide, Maestro. All right, so shifting into perceptions now. Um, for these studies, we have used uh, our regular idea surveys, and we also added a few questions. So um, these are some that I thought were important to examine between the two modalities. Something I think is really important is, is whether students come away from the class experience, and I would say this is truly important on the online side, with the perception that the instructor really knew me. So I've got this highlighted because, you know, three cheers for the online side. It is possible in an engaged online course to have students come away with a feeling that they were understood by the instructor. As a sidebar, this is completely self-serving because I was the online instructor, but, but still, the, the point holds, the point holds. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but, but here again, in, in, you know, you, you look down the two columns, you know, between the two modalities here, you know, perceptions of the, the technology, perceptions of achievement standards, you know, the, the, the two courses are right on top of one another here, perception wise, right? So you begin, we can go to the next slide, right? So you'd be getting the point of view, you know, between engagement and performance and perceptions that we're really not seeing any differences between the two modalities. But here's a little something. We, we asked students uh, whether getting to know other students is important to them and, and whether there were meaningful interactions in the course. But uh, here we have a little difference here. Online students reporting that getting to know other students isn't quite as important uh, as what is reported by the blended section. And on the next slide, take a look at this, all right? All of a sudden, blended students saying that the online experience, the online side of the course, not well suited to the way I like to learn, and the instructional approaches 
didn't motivate me to learn as much as perhaps on the online side. For our students, you know, a 3.3, not, you know, not a great rating. Hmm. So interesting, right? Getting my attention. Mm -hmm. And then finally, all right, now, now they really have my attention. We have similar engagements, similar takeaways from case studies, similar perceptions. The instructor knows us in both sections. And yet, despite all of that, we have a rating here of progress on relevant course objectives lower on the blended side than the online side. And really, if I had had to make a prediction, I, I would have predicted the other way around based on what we know about blended education. So now they've really got my attention. Um, and fortunately, as a next step, Diane and I actually met with the blended course section. It was a small group and we could get most of them all together in one group. For the online students, Wow, this was really this was really underlining just how complicated work schedules are for our students. We met with two of them for lengthy structured one-on-one -on -one interviews. So a group meeting with the blended group and two one-on-one -on -one interviews with students on the online side. Very edifying. Next slide, please. And we had we had a big structured interview protocol that we used uh, for 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 the interviews and the focus groups. So here are just some top line takeaways. In speaking with all of the students, a big takeaway was they perceive they perceive themselves as a team. In other words, our class group is a team. Why does this matter? Because they want for the modality to positively impact their ability to function as a team. And the blended group telling us, well, you you took away something from us here now see I would have said I would have said that on the blended side we've given you three days where there is real-time interaction with the instructor that was my perspective their perspective was you took away three days of real-time interaction with the instructor and you took a little something away from our ability to work as a team okay interesting didn't see that coming they also talk about, this won't surprise you, the importance of student-student and student-faculty connections. All students online and blended talking about the importance of story. And if you have ever seen the discussion boards in this class, they can be astounding. The professional experiences that the students share really are very edifying. All students recognizing that. But in the case of the online students, they're placing more focus, at least for the students with whom we spoke, placing more focus on the instructor. It's very important for the instructor to bring in expertise. They want the instructor on a very well-timed feedback cycle. They have very clear expectations with respect to the instructor. The, the blended students do too, but they really like that in-class, real-time interaction with the other students in the class. That's what they told us. Next slide. Fabulous. We talked with the students about how they learn. You know, what, what we, we asked them, give us the day in the life of an MBA student. And we really learned some things about learning routines. Some of the things that the online students in particular have put into place just, just blew my mind. These learning routines were less well developed for the blended students, but there's clearly a relationship between these routines and the students' ability to connect with the learning outcomes. They were pretty clear with us on that. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Okay, so just just tying tying it all up in a, in a ribbon here. Some implications, some next steps. Uh, benefits and challenges of blending. There's no question that a blended design is going to allow you to do some cool things. You can flip your lectures, you know, do some things in class you can't do online. But begs the question: What's the right blend? What's the right way to do this? And ultimately, Diane and I had to do a little intervention with the blended course group because they really wanted that real-time interaction, and we, we put it in there for them. Uh, so real-time interaction, the next, yeah, the next piece here, I suspect that we've reached a point in time where as we design online and blended courses, this is something we're going to have to design in um, more frequently, perhaps more intentionally than, than we're doing right now, if I may speak on behalf of the MBA program. The interaction between learning outcomes and learning routines is very, very interesting, and we spoke about that a bit on our, our blended inquiry team here. Um, it, it looks to us like the real-time interaction with the instructor that the students are asking for is very likely to provide a lot of support in the development of these learning routines for students who may not have them in place. And as a sidebar, 
this question of, of, student, of, of students feeling that they didn't meet the learning outcomes in, in the course is worth a little more exploration and, and it, it, it gives one pause, makes me wonder what is it that they had as a goal that might have been different and apart versus the course learning outcomes. And finally, just about, uh, just a final note about the concept of class group as a team. I'm accustomed to thinking of students as teams when they work on their assignments, but I had a little epiphany in the interviews and the focus group because what they're saying is, you know, we, we're just a team. This class group is a team, and if we function well as a team, then the, the class group experience is, is greatly enhanced for us. And there's an interesting point of intersection here with a, another uh, inquiry group that the business programs have going with Diane. Everywhere we go, there's Diane, and we are actually working on a team, a, a program-wide team philosophy that would have embedded within it some teamwork practices. So we're we're working on that, and and this particular project gave us gave us a heads up on some things to look for. So mm -hmm. there you go, five oh three. Thanks, Catherine. So and finally, we have uh, Terry with the uh, special ed course SPE five oh seven. Hi, everybody. Um, so I looked at um, 507, which is Methods of Social and Emotional Support, kind of like a classroom management, but a lot more dimensional than that, I think. Um, I taught three courses, so I was a teacher in all of these, um, in three different modalities over two terms. So in the fall, I taught an online course um, and a blended course. And in the winter, I taught a face-to-face -face course. And you can see the, the ends and stuff there. Uh, the data sources were um, D2L tools, idea survey, a focus group I did with the face-to-face -face group, and I kept a research journal. So um, context in it out being really important in my research. So I want to tell you a little bit about the three groups. The first. The blended group was a year, a first year alt cert group. That means that they're the teacher of record in their own classroom while they're learning to be teachers. Um, we know that this was a fall class that our fall alt cert students are um, tend to be very overwhelmed, sometimes depressed, and definitely very stressed. The course topic is related to one of their sources of stress, which is classroom management. Um, what I found out is that this group was taking four courses this term and working full-time in a very stressful situation. I also found out really relatively soon on that they were a troubled cohort. They had some um, dynamic problems. Uh, they didn't all like each other and they sometimes said so. Um, and by the fall when I was teaching them, three or four students were either thinking about quitting or they were trying to change jobs, so there was a, a lot going on. The online group was a second year alt cert, and the difference between first and second is day and night. By this point, they've gotten their sea legs, they have a sense of what schools are about um, and who they are as a teacher. This was a very bonded group, very supportive, so very mature, wise people in it. Um, and I had taught them previously, so I had a little bit of a relationship with them. And, but I found out they also were taking four courses in this term, walk, working full time. And a few of them were actually taking five, making up for some courses that they had missed so that they could finish in this term. Um, next slide. Hmm. Not advancing, okay. Okay, the next one, it was a, what we would think of more as like a typical special ed group, mostly MAT students, but all but one person in this group of 16 worked in school. So a lot of teacher's aides, um, but some practicing teachers, MED students, we had a social worker, school psychologist, so a lot of range, um, but they were only taking one to two courses. Um, they, understood schools because most of them worked in it, but they were a real bonded, healthy cohort with great routines. They were there when I showed up. They did really, you know, great assignments, and um, they were near the end of their program, so they were far along. 
All right, just to get a broad overview of um, sort of the summary um, outcomes on IDEA, I looked at progress on relevant objectives. I looked at overall rating of the instructor and overall rating of the course. And you can see that the online and face-to-face -face groups are pretty similar in their assessments, but in every category, the blended group is less. And um, particularly this overall rating of the course is 3.8 is something that um, I don't think I've ever had since I, we've been doing IDEA data. So this blended um, course was something I was very motivated to, to think about and learn about and um, go ahead and move on, Diane. So the research questions that I looked at are up here in blue at the top. And this, this one addresses what are the learning routines and how did they vary across context. And um, I looked at three different assignments and how they sort of played out um, in these different modalities. So the first one, um, I had a family systems paper and in the blended and online course, I had them do it as individual papers. It's very in depth. And I really felt like I did get to know the students from this paper. I started out the course with it, lots of insights into them as individuals. Um, in the face-to-face, -face, I did it as a, a small group activity on the first night of class, and they reported out. Um, I didn't feel like I got almost anything out of it as far as really getting to know the individual students. There was no record of it. It was over when it was over. And um, the difference in these is that in the first two, in the student's final paper, they referenced this assignment a lot, where in the face-to-face, -face, um, they didn't, almost no one referenced um, the, the systems paper. So I don't think it had as, you know, the learning for that for me was that, you know, definitely I'll do this as a paper in the future, and that it didn't work as well um, in the small group. The next thing was, it was two research projects, and an interesting point was that I gave them in every group the choice to work together or in teams. In the online group, who were pretty bonded but very busy, two groups of two worked and collaborated together, but ten worked independently. In the blended group, who were having some real struggles with one another, they all chose to work independently on this assignment. And um, in the face-to-face, only two people worked alone and the other 14 people um, grouped. So very different choices of how they would work together. The other thing is, is that um, in the blended and face-to-face, -face, they had the, they did two research projects and I gave them the choice of presenting one of them in class and one of them online. And um, for the face-to-face -face group, and this reminds me a little bit of Catherine's findings, they felt like they were cheated out of giving that second presentation in class, like that it was just nowhere, it didn't honor their work to put it online and have them discuss it online. Um, the next one is I gave the students the exact same assignment in all three classes was an online book discussion. Um, can you go to the next page, Diane? Mm -hmm. So um, you can't see, I can't see the bottom, maybe you guys can, but I know what's there. Um, what was interesting is that it was the exact same assignment, and what I looked at is the number of posts read. And for the online group, um, it, for chapter one, so this is at the beginning of the course, and the beginning of the book, and this is at the end of the book, and the end of the course. Um, but for chapter one, they read about um, 10 posts each, and um, so 150 altogether. I had expected since they liked each other more and they were more interested in each other that they would have read more than this blended group. But this blended group who weren't talking to each other very well in class were reading more of one another's assignment or post. So I found that very interesting. But the face-to-face -face group read more than any of them in the beginning. Um, both the online and blended group by the end of the book, they had declined in how much they were reading, um, but the face-to-face -face group actually increased. So 
I just I found this very interesting, um, and I would have begin to hypothesize maybe that oh, the more they're face to face, the more that they read each other's stuff, which is a finding that Lisa had. But I'm right now teaching two online sections, and both of them in their first chapter um, are up over 300. So higher than any of these. So I don't know what to make of it. But I found interesting that it's the same exact assignment and quite different hmm. um, levels of engagement. So the next one, Diane. This one looks at um, the relationship building routines across the modalities. And this had similar findings to, um, I think, Catherine, as far as the instructor really knew me in the blended. Um, but you can look and see the online, so, sorry. The, so we have the instructor really knew me, the instructor was engaged, um, learning activities uh, included meaningful interactions among students and getting to know the other students. So that's how it goes down there. If you look, the online and face-to-face -face are you know, pretty comparable, but once again, the blended. Um, and what's so interesting is they had done that family systems assignment where I feel like, wow, I know them better than I know most people in my life. You know, I got all these details, but they still, and I saw them five times, did not feel like I knew them um, to the extent that the others did. And yet they felt like I was just in, as engaged as far as my participation. Um, mm -hmm. They did not find their learning activities as meaningful as the other groups that they did together and they were not as interested in knowing one another as a matter of fact I think they were kind of sorry that they knew one another <laughs> Go on to the next hmm. so this one is what are the assumptions behind our learning routines and just I'm not going to go into any detail about this but you know I assume that I would be able I, I knew this is an emotional course for students particularly those alt cert students I thought the face-to-face -face component, if I actually made a hypothesis before I started this, that that those first-year alt-cert students, they needed that face-to-face -face time. They needed to have the safety of seeing each other and to be able to talk about what they were going through. Um, and I assumed I'd be able to facilitate those difficult conversations. And um, what was interesting to me is just the realization, and I know we know this, but that the, the students came into every one of these classes with their group dynamics already pretty set up. They'd had other courses together. I was the new kid on the block. So in the online, where I didn't think they would trust as much, this is a group that's been together for over a year and a half. They have a great relationship. They revealed all kinds of things on, on online. And as far as me facilitating the group, I didn't have to. They already had formed a respectful, trustful group, easy stuff for me. The blend it, where I thought I was going to save them there in person, they didn't trust each other. They came in not trusting each other. I never really established the trust with them as a group. They would talk to me afterwards. Um, and I was not able to effectively facilitate their online discussion, I mean, their face-to-face -face discussions, because... By the time I knew there was a problem, it was the third class, and I had two more classes. I didn't have enough time to really turn the corner with that. Um, and the last group already trusted each other. The other thing I assumed is that the students would have time to do the work in the classes. I think when we set up classes, we assume that. But um, both the online and blended students were taking four classes and working full time. And one third of the students in each of the classes took an incomplete. Um, Time was an enormous issue. That was not an issue with the last class. Hmm. Alone, Diane. Um, so this one is, you know, how do you build relationships outside of the learning routines? Well, the big issue with this course, particularly with the first two groups, was time. There was just no way. It's a pretty heavy-duty course, and they absolutely did not have time to do it. So. They let me know that right up front, like, oh my God, we're drowning and so on. And so my response to them was to collapse two of the modules into one, freeing up a week so they could catch up. They didn't catch up in that week. They did other, they're taking three other courses. They did the work for those courses in that week. Um, 
I provided two extra credit opportunities um, that they heavily um, attended and took advantage of to help sort of bolster their grades. And then the bottom thing that you can't see on here is that I, I didn't dock them for being late because they were just mm -hmm. drowning. Mm -hmm. Go to the next one, Diane. So I treated those two groups exactly the same. I had the exact same accommodations. I listened to them. They had the same thing. And yet, um, hmm. this first one is the online group, and um, the second one is the blended. I, this is from their idea comments. I coded them, and I came up really with five themes. This last one is not really a theme. Um, but the first one is too much work. And you can see the first group, 20% of the comments were, yeah, there's too much work. But that was always tied to the value of the course when they, in the sentence. Um, but 30% of them commented on my responsiveness. You know, thanks for responding. Thanks for hearing us. Thanks for giving us these kinds of um, opportunities so that we could get this done. Um, the next group. <laughs> over 50% the comments were just too much work and they weren't tied to statements but it was a valuable class there was some talking about it being valuable not nearly as much as the other two but you could just feel when I when you read these like they really had a problem with how much I assigned and didn't seem to notice how much I cut in, in the efforts I made to make it doable so um, Two courses, same response. I think very different perceptions by the students as far as to how helpful that was or how helpful I was. Um, there was a little talk in the face-to-face um, -face course about too much work, but it was framed much more positively. Um, another interesting thing that I found in this, um, in both courses where there was either a face-to-face -face course or the blended, these um, kind of golden color, these are comments that are very personalized to the instructor. You know, you were great, you were creative, you were thoughtful, whatever. None of those comments came in the online course, mm -hmm. even though I had a good relationship with these students. So what I made out of that is that I think not only are students concerned with us knowing them, I think they want to know us. And, and that's what I think sort of accounts for these sort of more personalized, sometimes they talked right to me in the, uh, you know, thank you, Terry, you were this in the evaluation. Um, but much higher sort of sense of um, the value of the course there too. Just go to the next one, Diane. Um, this just is a little data on what I was just showing you, and this is how they talk differently about the amount of work. So in that online course, you know, I really enjoyed the course, as well as the feedback we received from the instructor, but there was too much reading. Where in the blended, it was just Dr. Smith assigned more written assignments than my other two classes combined. It was that kind of like, you did something wrong. Um, where in the face-to-face, -face, it was like the course was very challenging with a high work expectation. So this sort of polite, you did give us a lot, but, you know, um, go to the next, Diane. And then just the outcomes. So now you have a sense of these three groups. Um, you can look and see that the, the final grades in the online were 11 A's and 3 B's and 89% across. There were five incompletes, but they all completed at the next term. And nine students took um, advantage of the extra credit opportunities, which definitely bolstered these grades. Um, in the blended, there were seven A's, six B's, one incomplete that turned to an N, and one with um, draw. 84% average, um, and 11 students took advantage of those extra credit opportunities. In the face-to-face, -face, uh, 15 A's, one B, 93% average. No incompletes, and they weren't given an extra credit because uh, mm. they weren't drowning. Mm. Next, almost done. So we, the, our question is, what is the challenges in each modality? But I just focused on blended, and I think some of the challenges are establishing relationships in two modalities, 
difficulties in switching between modalities, students feeling less known by the instructor and like they know the instructor less, not having enough time to address troubled group dynamics that if there is a problem in the group that comes to you um, and you have that face-to-face -face space and all the emotions that come with it, three or five meetings is really a hard sell to try to turn that around and teach the things you want to teach too. Time management challenging and increased potential for contextual variability. And all of those things, I think, impact how the students perceive and engage in the assignments, perceive the overall quality of the course and the instructor. So I think we have some things we really need to look into here. Go to the next. So these were just, I focused just on two findings. Um, I think I, I did purposely look at the variation in these courses. But I think the contextual possibilities and constraints combined with the, you know, the possibilities and constraints of each of different modalities really make for a good deal of variability in our course delivery and outcome and quality that go beyond the course design and the instructor. I think a lot of times we think that it's, you know, it's the instructor or it's the design, but there are a lot of other things going on. And so I think we need to design our courses with maximum flexibility so that people can be responsive. Um, universal design is, is a good way to do that. Um, but we need to be able to support our adjuncts who are picking these up. I could combine two, I created the course, I could combine two modules, I could do a lot of things to try to respond to what the students were going through. I'm not sure everybody has that ability to do that and I, I think we should figure out how. Um, and I don't think we should create programs that require nor encourage students to take more classes at a time than they can reasonably do. I mean, really behind so much of these issues were full-time um, teachers taking four and five courses. Last slide. Um, building trusting relationships and facilitating group dynamics may, may be a little more complex in the blended um, learning designs. So I recommend that, um, you know, we explicitly think about ways to address that, to build those relationships. Um, and in the last thing is to also, you know, we, we often will do sort of a, a formative assessment around the students and who they are and what they need. But I think we may need to look at groups as well. You know, I think we need to systematically try to pass on some of that information when we have it, like, hey, this is a troubled cohort who hate each other. You know, like, it would be good to have known that ahead of time. <laughs> um, or, you know, they're taking five classes. You know, somebody else may not have figured that out and may not, you know, may have kind of punished them for things that were really beyond their control. So that's it. Thanks, Terry. So now we wanted to open it up and um, hoping you're remembering back all the details and parts and pieces of the various um, course designs and projects and data. Um, open it up to your thoughts, your reactions, what's surprising? Hi, I'm Joe Levy, Director of Assessment. Um, first of all, I think all this information is pretty neat um, and interesting and I'm also happy to see many, uh, so many faculty looking to do this type of work and dig deeper and, and, and wrestle with these questions and, um, and even dig deeper where it goes against our, our assumptions or what literature even says. Uh, you know, I'm even surprised with all the sort of backwards findings we're seeing with the blended uh, model versus the online. But um, one of the things that I would say too, and this is more just a comment is, um, from you know, a curriculum design perspective and um, you know, credit hour compliance and accreditation, uh, one of the challenges we have to look to stay on top of is having equivalent learning experiences across the modalities. And so I think this is really great work to help inform that. Um, and I know at least from the credit hour compliance perspective, uh, we're talking about ways with which assessment and accreditation uh, can be partnering with the colleges to maybe audit or sample some of those um, 
forms created for courses because there should be one for every course and every modality of that course to not only make sure there's a form there and see what the content is, but to then dig even just a little bit to look at the high level outcomes of the students and see if there are any initial red flags of, holy cow, you know, this online course is doing dramatically better than this face-to-face -face or hybrid course or vice versa. And then looking into that because, um, you know, that shouldn't just be something that goes unchecked. Um, and as, as I'm sure you all know, it's not as a, a, just a simple fix or a wave of a wand or just a simple coaching session with the faculty that can, you know, write that, that direction, but at least for it to stay on our radar and know where and which courses and maybe if there's trends with disciplines or student behaviors that even are cross-disciplinary that we can be uh, sharing with one another, I think will um, only help there. So no question, just comment and glad that, you know, you all are doing good work here and I hope to see more of this and hope to also be involved in, in uh, some more of this work and conversation. Yeah, I hope you are. Um, just a, a quick um, comment, uh, wonderful job and thank you so much for doing all this great work and I, I had to multitask on a couple of things um, while, um, while you were all presenting, um, so I think I picked up most of it. What I was curious about, and maybe this is sort of out of scope of, of this particular project, is how did the actual instruction sort of, you know, relate to the data, right? So in terms of faculty behaviors, how did you see any of that influencing some of these outcomes, or was that really strictly not part of the scope of the, the research? Anybody want to comment? Well, I could say briefly from the from the MBA side of it, Betty Jo. The one thing you know, it's so it's so hard to to capture, isn't it? The whole the whole global concept of instruction. But but we were able to actually count the number of posts in the MBA program that Barbara made or that that I made, and so. For those particular course sections, you could see that the instructors were similarly engaged, if we could put it that way, because they were posting it just almost at exactly the same percentage relative to total posts in the, in the course. I think there's also something to be said for using, um, or that it impacts the results here, the fact that we're using um, prepared templates you know, because students are really, they're really seeing the same thing. They're being asked to do the same things. And then on top of that, you have instructors engaging at about the same amount. So you, those are, those are huge inputs. Yeah. Huge inputs that we can take a look at. And I thought from, because I was the teacher in all three courses, um, that, you know, that was held pretty constant. And I, I thought about it with all the variation with one teacher, um, how that might be if it was three different teachers that would have added to the variation of just performance um, in that course. Mm -hmm. um, I, have a, I have a comment. I'm here with Elizabeth. It's Jeff Winter. Uh, I thought it was very interesting, uh, all the reports. Thank you very much. Um, just to see at least how little correlation I detected between the modalities and the ratings. So, you know, I kind of expected the blended <coughs> to be more favorable, but that was perhaps one of the takeaways for me that any, I think any of these modalities can be, uh, well, I'll use the word trumped. I'm sorry, it's in my vocabulary. Uh, uh, can be trumped by personal dynamics in the class. And uh, so if there is a group of students with some kind of, and there's a dysfunctional dimension to the class, whether something maybe flared up online or what, what happened with Terry Joes, with you know, something she inherited, um, I think that, that it's gonna be really hard to overcome that with any of these modalities. So uh, I, I just, these presentations make make it so that I really, I'd like to look at some, some more meta studies. I'd like to see what larger groups uh, have found with, with the, you know, faced, you know, the, the three different modalities and, and what is the, 
what are the tendencies there? What, what seem to, are there any internal advantages that you kind of start the class with if you're teaching face-to-face -face versus blended versus online? So I found it really interesting. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey um, I, I apologize, you guys, for having to run away before the conversation's over. I just, I just wanted to pipe in and, and, and say this has been such an interesting and important um, conversation. And thank you, um, you know, Diane and Anthony for organizing and the folks who took the time to really analyze, you know, to teach across three platforms and really kind of reflect on, you know, have, on the data about what worked and what didn't. Um, you know, I think as we think about you know, the future of our programs in this institution, you know, it's not about, you know, do you or don't you, um, you know, blend in online and face to face, but how do you do it? And how do you adapt your practice um, and you, the way the content is delivered to ensure that the student experience is really high quality, regardless of modality. And I think what we've seen from, from, you know, this, um, and I think, you know, Jeff, you know, mentioned, you know, what kind of meta-analyses are out there. And, you know, um, there is some interesting stuff. Barbara Means, um, some time ago, did a, a, a study looking, it was more K-12, but it was looking at, you know, this kind of stuff. And I think the, the conclusion is, you know, you can have really high levels of student success and satisfaction if you attend to the design and how you how you deliver. So I, I think this is just awesome food for thought because it really helps us inform how we how we go forward with this stuff. So um, thank you and looking forward to the next ones and sorry to bail before we're done. Yeah, stay tuned. I think we'll have Tara's data in a little bit after she finishes the quarter. So we'll hopefully can continue the conversation. Hi, I apologize if this was addressed earlier. Uh, I, I came in late for uh, uh, an overlapping commitment. Um, I was wondering uh, from uh, uh, Betty Jo's talk, which I was the only part I heard, um, I noticed that the student's perception of the amount of work was highest in the blended. And my question is, how, uh, what, what, what uh, caution did you take to not fulfill the stereotype of the blended course being course and a half? Oh, is that Terry's course, maybe? Oh, I thought that I thought it was from Terry's course. Yeah, I Terry was the one talking. Yeah, 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 yeah. You said I thought you said Betty Jo though. It threw me. No, off. I, I thought I said Terry, but okay. it's been that kind of a day. I, I think, think it was. I think yeah. it was Terry. I think it was the Jo part that was the connector there. Oh, um, right, right. So um, when I when I created the the courses, I laid out the whole thing and I looked at all the activities side by side for the blended and for the online. And I was very careful to, um, to think about what would happen in the classroom that would take place of some of the, you know, of the, um, the out of class activities. So I, I tried to keep that in account. Like I did look across them. I didn't just create, I created them at the same time. And I was trying, I, I did pay attention to that by having them both in my scope and in my sight at the same time and trying to balance out where do I take something, where do I, um, you know, where do I leave things the same um, so that I didn't do the course and a half. Um, I think the perceptions may be much more related to um, that they were just so totally stressed out in being in their first term of an alt cert program, teaching for the first time, and being really, really overwhelmed. So I, I think their emotionality and the fact that they didn't feel like they had each other to turn to for support, I think it impacted a lot of their perceptions. Mm -hmm. They also didn't seem to come to trust me. And so the things I did to try to ease their load, um, I don't think they reckon, I think they were just darn angry. Another piece that I didn't bring up is that so they were taking four courses. It was every other Saturday. There were three other instructors. They told me at one point, like, please don't assign us things for the off week. 
that none of the other instructors assigned them anything um, for the week that they weren't meeting. So I think they kind of compared me to what other people were doing um, and thought that I was, you know, I, I think that may have gone into their perception as well. So I think we need to talk in these cluster groups where they're, you know, they need to have a consistent experience. So mm -hmm. I think they were also comparing me to classes where there was no, there was no online component. They were just having class every other week. Terry mm -hmm. Joe. This is Angela, and I'm teaching in the, the alt cert as well. So I'd like to talk to you because that sounds like a cohort I taught, and they were telling me the same things. So uh, we can talk offline, but I would really like to thank everyone. This is really fascinating to hear the reflection and analysis of our own practices. So thank you so much for doing this and for sharing. And, and um, it's so helpful. So, I wanted to quickly bring up, because I don't know if, if Lisa had a chance to, to talk about it, but I thought it was so interesting that one of the tools that she used was the Zoom web conference. And as far as building a community of learners and engaging students and what you do in those weeks that you're not in the face-to-face -face classroom, having like, I think these optional synchronous sections, she found to be helpful. Mm -hmm. I think it was interesting. Yeah, thanks, Susanna. I didn't mention it, but uh, because I really didn't collect any data on it, but it's something I've been exploring more and more is finding ways to kind of strengthen at least the relationship building part of the courses by using Zoom for the fully online or the courses that we offer that are less face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to work, you know, I'm, there's some trial and error to it about what works well and what doesn't, but it is definitely something that I think we can use and maybe explore a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I think the MBA group might consider utilizing it as a tool for some of their blended. Catherine, I don't know if that was something that you guys are perfect. Well, looking at. That was the intervention that we put into place for the blended group here that was seeking more real-time interaction, and we have kept that going. And interestingly, I just got some positive feedback on it from an instructor who, who has them now. Mm -hmm. And I think in general, there are a number of potential applications for Zoom and, and real-time conferencing with students, not, not only around helping them to, to develop learning routines, which might be primary, but, but also around certain kinds of subject matter discussions, like your cases um, and so forth. But we talked with the online students about that, and they had some mixed feelings about that, and they have experience with that, and they've seen instructors do that really well, and they've seen it be really on the frenetic side, you, you know, where, where you get into a case discussion and you have 30 people on the, you know, on the line. So, uh, but I, I think that's, um, that's a road down which we will want to travel next, and it will be a matter of figuring out how, how you do that right, how you do that well. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts, questions? I think, you know, one of the things that, there are a couple big takeaways for me and in, in moving forward, thinking about how we can um, study at the activity level. I mean, if, I feel like what this exposed to me is the importance of thinking about the specific learning outcomes for activities and, and how the face-to-face -face time does or doesn't help that. I think Terry Joe's data spoke to that quite a bit and as well as others that, you know, there may be, and how, how, to, how to kind of study that within our courses, like what, what's working better for the learning outcome that you want to achieve. It's, if it's about relationships, maybe there's real-time communication. If it's about, you know, content, digging deeper into a content area. I mean, so really thinking, differentiating those learning outcomes clearly and use leveraging the technology in a way that advances it um, is, is where I think I'd like to see us unpack a little bit more. I love the table of comparing the same learning activities across different modalities and kind of thinking that through how to accommodate. 
And then the other thing that really stuck out is the expectations of both the students and the faculty for what's going on and what, what the routines were and what, what's happening within it and how important the program context is influencing those expectations and how students enter a course. And um, I'm curious why, Terry, your course, this SPE 507, was it for one group taught in year one of the program and for another group taught in year two? And it had such different, uh, such a different impact on their learning experience. Um, so the I, hard thing for Alt-Cert is always just trying to figure out, they need everything immediately. They're teaching. Yeah. They don't. So I can tell you for working in Alt-Cert for ever since we had our first Teach for America um, cohort, trying to figure out what to put in that first term. We're constantly shoveling it around, trying because they need classroom management, but they need literacy instruct. You know, I mean, it's like, what do you take out? Um, so I, I'm not sure what led to that. I wasn't a part of those decisions. I do know a history of us constantly shuffling, trying to get the, mm -hmm. the things they need the most into that first term. I think it made sense to put this course in the first term because of the issues with classroom management, but um, who knows? Yeah, and then, then, then the, the challenge of taking four other classes at the same time or three, three other classes at the same time is, is a lot. So I, I just think these, these, this type of inquiry that we did across disciplines was enlightening, but doing this within programs in systematic ways is gonna be really helpful to continually understand the student learning process and what works best. You know, one of the things that I learned in this was to use some of the tools we already have in more intentional ways. I always look at my idea data, but I don't study it. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, good, good. Oh, I wonder what that was. And I'll think about it a little bit. But, you know, really um, carefully looking at this in relationship to some of the contextual issues and some of, the, you know, looking across data instead of just, okay, I'm looking at my idea data, but now I'm looking at my D2L data. And, I, you know, it's like those things, um, I found out ways to look at data on D2L that I didn't know. So there's some really relatively simple at our fingertips data. Um, and I, you know, and I think this is probably true for, um, a few of us is that you know I just had to really pick from oceans of data what I would focus on here because I could have spent the whole time just on looking at teaching activities in different modalities because I had that for all of the activities in the class and I had thought about it very intentionally so it's a lot of fun it takes some time but it, it really I really enjoyed the process I enjoyed working across but I did learn some really important things about using data mm -hmm. um, that I hadn't done before. And I, I, I think that in itself is worthwhile. So doing it in programs, um, I think, would be, a, you know, just a, a really good learning activity mm -hmm. for programs. Yeah. And professional development. I really see it as a really important vehicle for, for faculty continuous development over time because there's so much to learn just through our own efforts and through student feedback and through student learning evidence. What about others? What were like some from the whole process, Lisa? Um, any big takeaways for you from this? Um, no, I mean, it just makes me feel like there's so much more we could be doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so I, I think it was interesting to just look at it from not only my perspective, but then my colleagues and other programs and the, the way that, that blended learning is approached and, um, and there's so many kind of subtleties to it and different mm -hmm. ways to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I, I think there, maybe there isn't one right way. It's just mm -hmm. finding a way that works for a particular group of students at a particular moment in time with a particular instructor, you know, but maybe if we have sort of a toolbox mm -hmm. of things that we can say, this is what we think mm -hmm. um, comprises best practice in blended mm -hmm. learning. 
then then instructors can sort of choose from that and figure out what works for them. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm interested in, as we move forward, looking at things like, um, you know, other ways of doing blended learning. Like I know Tara, I think, is looking at every week with, you know, because we'll be doing that with HP3 in the fall, is meeting them every week and then having some content online. But then also looking at fully online and how we can use levers like Zoom and maybe other types of um, grouping mm -hmm. that we can do in D2L. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different things that I'm interested in looking at. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's been a learning process for sure. Mm -hmm. For me, I thought it was really valuable, the questions that we added to the idea survey, mm -hmm. because they really targeted um, like the navigation that students had throughout the course, um, the meeting mm -hmm. interactions. And well, you can somewhat look at the data that's online. It's just so helpful to have those um, survey questions that really target the student experience and was it meaningful and were they able to navigate the course. So I'd love to to see that used more for maybe some of our fully online and blended courses so we can keep gathering some of that really important student feedback. That's a good point, Susanna. We did go to the IDEA um, <laughs> website and they actually have suggested uh, another suggested set of questions for online and blended courses and we adopted not and, and we stopped using some of the other standard ones that are used in it. So we, it, we didn't make a longer survey, I don't think. It's, it's about the same, but we swapped out questions and we put in, and I will add them to the PowerPoint. I didn't get a chance to do that yet, but the, we'll, we'll put what those were at the end of the, as an appendix at the end of this PowerPoint so that you can see um, what those look like. Any other takeaways that anybody wanted to highlight before we run out of time? We've got a, a few, uh, five more minutes. I just, I just wanted to say I found it all really fascinating, and I think that there's just uh, lots of implications for all teacher prep programs, and it'd be interesting to find out more about, I, I don't know how you do it, but uh, particularly with those field placement coursework, um, you know, if we can do some research and data on that, because uh, I just read the, somebody, the, Zoom group chat. I just think there's such a social emotional component to people who are doing their field experiences or student teaching. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just think that's an area to explore for teacher prep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I just want to say too, um, a, a comment that I had or a question that I would pose for the group or, or be interested to hear is, you know, you all certainly took intentional time and effort uh, to do this. And so just to reiterate what some other folks have said too is, you know, how can we embed some of this into general faculty practice or promote more of this awareness or looking to the data um, so that it, it and, and obviously we, we may not be able to do the same scope, right? But how can we start incrementally thinking in this way or integrating these practices more in the day to day um, because as you all attest to very interesting insights, ways that you were able to then react and respond in your courses and, and the way you're thinking about your courses moving forward. So there's obviously benefit to the faculty in looking at the information uh, in this way, um, but how can, we, how can we do that in a way that both is effective but also efficient so that it's not draining or taking away their, their time or energy from, from other things. Good question. Any of you want to? I did notice some question. Actually, as we've been um, as we've been talking a little bit here, I've been thinking that it would be interesting for me, for my part, to take uh, just the little MBA piece here to the group of adjunct faculty that I meet with on an ongoing basis and, and kind of get their read on it, particularly because for me, you know, I see 
good things happening. They're, you know, students are taking away good things, whether they're blended or, or online, but we're moving into a period here where it's time to, you know, nip and tuck for excellence. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want for students to, to perform well and be engaged and come away from the class feeling like, well, we didn't really meet all of my objectives. So um, that, you know, there, there's something we can design into the program on the MBA side having to do with real time interaction that I think can benefit the students. To, to Joe's point, I think, um, there is so much time on task and involved in extracting all of this data from your courses. But if we can meet as a group and begin to discuss the data that we have, that's, I think, a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. as, as far as the time components, it, there was time involved with it, but it wasn't a terrible amount. Of, you know, it, I would find before we were going to meet, I was so happy that Diane had, you know, scheduled these meetings. I think, okay, we're meeting at 10 o'clock. So I'd get up early that morning and I'd look at it, you know, I would do what I needed to do before we would meet at 10 in those couple of hours before that. Um, so I, because the data is there, the finger, our fingertips, it, I think it could be done without a tremendous amount of time. More time went into thinking about how to present it to others than actually doing the analysis. Mm -hmm. That was that's where you had to really like think. Well, how do I say this, and what do I say, and and that took some time. But just the looking at the data and having conversations about it, I think if you weren't presenting out, um, wouldn't be that time consuming. I also noticed that's in the performance review. There's some suggestions about how to look at and think about your idea data, I think. I'm um, not sure, but so not that that's it. You know, it's the group working that's that's more important. But I do think that, you know, beginning to build some, some times to do this, maybe have one of our data retreats be more focused on spending the day doing this with our colleagues um, and, you know, once we get through CAPE and NCE, we might have time to to keep doing this without, you know, this is what we need to do for CAPE being tied to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's creating some intentional time and, and a little bit of structure and, the, the you know, bringing together people that have a reason, you know, some common goals or interests and questions about the data. And I think that can go a long way. It's, it's um, energizing because it is what people care about. <laughs> you know, it's, it's sort of, it is the work. It is the main work. Um, and, it, and I would imagine that it will make the next iterations of design and, and um, review a little easier in some regards because, you know, each, there isn't always a heavy lift every time you, you if, if we think of these as, as sort of in terms of cycles of, of looking at courses or sets of courses over time. I did find myself, because I'm teaching the same course again online right now, two sections of it, and um, there were just things that I set up in looking at these other three sections that I'm automatically looking at in these. Mm -hmm. I, I can't even stop myself from looking mm -hmm. at those things. You know, it's now, it's kind of like once you see the, you know, the pattern in the clouds, it's hard not to see the horse anymore. But whatever it is, is it, so doing the work kind of sensitizes you to, um, you know, being more intentional and, and noticing things, even when you're not, you know, explicitly researching the next course. No, that, but that, that's a good point. I, I, was, I was hoping something like that. And then, then I think if we have regular opportunities to sort of share out like this, folks that are doing this thinking, and then others can sort of take some of those tools or frames and, and experiment and, and look at their own courses in that way, um, I think it'll be a, a, an interesting way to sort of build um, inquiry into our practice Uh, this is Barb Gomez, and I'm an adjunct. I've been an adjunct in the language minority department for many years, and I find this information fascinating. And thank you all so much for, for sharing and working on it. I'd love to see more training, like you said, Diane, professional development for adjuncts, because 
we have at least 50 adjuncts in our department that work in various cohorts across MAT, undergrad and graduate for language minority. And mm -hmm. it would be so helpful if each one of us kind of took some time to look at our own. I've always been frustrated that my idea surveys aren't at 100%, you know, response, mm -hmm. even though I spend so much time in the last two weeks going over that with my students. So mm -hmm. um, any, you know, further help that we could uh, give our students to help them feel that uh, they're heard, and mm -hmm. I, I, I loved your recommendations, Terry Jo. That's awesome. But thank you all for doing what you did. Thanks, Barb. That's good feedback. Well, we're just about at time. Um, if there are any other, um, I don't want to prematurely stop the conversation. I'm, but, uh, other thoughts? Well, thank you all for coming. This, um, I apologize, I just <laughs> forgot to turn the recorder on for the first little bit of this session, but we'll, um, the PowerPoint and most of the recording will be there on, in the, I'll put it up in the D2L shell where we've got the other um, forums uh, represented. So this will be archived for review by others who weren't able to come. And, uh, Hi, Diane. I have a request. I uh -huh. have not been able to be at those meetings and kind of uh, just realized that this meeting is on, so I joined late. Um, could you also put, when you're putting it on the, on, the, on the D2L, write, you may already do that, the date of the meeting. Mm -hmm. So I know which one to open. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Sure. All right, well, stay tuned. We will be scheduling um, more conversations like this and for sure with uh, Tara's data. And, uh, uh, you know, please reach out to me if you have an interest in sort of building a community among your program team or your adjunct team. With your adjunct team, I'd love to support that, that work and help you structure it and, um, you know, schedule make schedules and help you build tools to support it so uh, let me know what your needs are thank you diane this has been great fun okay and great learning we'll talk to you all soon thanks Bye, again everyone. thanks again bye, -bye.